Thank you all for coming. I'm Valerie Neal. I am one of the space history curators here in the National Air and Space Museum, and I happen to be the curator for Space Shuttle and uh, Contemporary Human Space Flight. And we are gathered today to remember the Challenger tragedy on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of that. And I'd like to start by pointing out to you this commemorative plaque, which was a gift from NASA to the museum shortly after the tragedy happened. Uh, NASA made these plaques for all of the families of the crew and gave one to the Air and Space Museum as well. And it includes a portrait of each crew member, a patch for the mission, and a U.S. flag. And the most interesting thing about uh, this plaque is that the flag itself was recovered from the debris of the Challenger when the debris was brought up from the ocean floor. Uh, on every mission, there are uh, clusters of flags and patches and other commemorative items that are flown in what's called the official flight kit and they're bundled together and they're wrapped in plastic and they're put inside a locker. And uh, they were able to retrieve these and quite a bit of other equipment from the debris. Uh, so it's a very special commemorative plaque. Now to the events of the Challenger tragedy and the significance of it. Uh, 1986 was supposed to have been a banner year for the space shuttle. Nine missions had flown the previous year. Twelve were on the schedule for 1986. All four orbiters were in service. Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, and Atlantis. Uh, NASA was ramping up. Uh, they had one or two missions per month scheduled throughout 1986. One mission was flown in early January, uh, rather uneventfully, and then 51L was to be the 25th mission of the space shuttle in five years. That was a benchmark, uh, a milestone to reach. And as we know, um, things went terribly awry during the ascent uh, of that mission. Uh, barely a minute off the launch pad, there was what was at the time called a mishap. Um, but everyone who was watching the mission in person or on television could immediately see that something was wrong because the nice straight plume of exhaust suddenly bifurcated into these bizarre-looking limbs and vapor trails were going off in various directions, and you knew immediately that this wasn't right, that something terrible had happened. And... Um, of course, the immediate thing that happened is that seven special people lost their lives in that moment or shortly thereafter in full view um, of the public and their death was replayed over and over and over again all day, all evening and for days thereafter and even still to the present day on television. Uh, that footage has become seared into our memory uh, as evidence of a day of tragedy. Uh, so let's remember the crew for just a moment. Um, they had full, rich lives. They had dreams of the future. Uh, they had great careers in progress. All of that curtailed far too soon. And of course, they had families. Um, Dick Scobie was commanding his first mission. He had already flown as pilot two years earlier, but this was his first command. Uh, Mike Smith was flying his first flight as a pilot. He was a Navy pilot who had flown A-6 intruders. Um, Scobie had been an Air Force pilot, Vietnam veteran, and also a test pilot. Um, so you had two experienced pilots in the cockpit, obviously. Among the mission specialists, Ellison Onizuka was making his second flight. Uh, he was also a pilot, but he had turned scientist astronaut, and he was the payload commander. Uh, 
on this mission. He had flown once also in 1984. Judy Resnick had already flown once and was making her second flight. She had proved her merits as an operator of the remote manipulator arm, the Canada arm, and she was expert in lifting satellites out of the payload bay and on this mission would have been doing the same thing. Um, we also had Ron McNair, who was a PhD, as was Judy Resnick. Ron McNair, a PhD electrical engineer, who was on board for his second flight, having flown already on a Department of Defense mission in 1985. So here's the 25th mission, and you already have crews who are making their second flights. A very experienced crew. And then in addition to the astronauts who were on board, there were two guest astronauts, one of whom you know by heart, I suspect, and the other you may not remember or may not have ever quite heard of. Uh, Krista McAuliffe is the first. She had been selected to be the first teacher in space as part of a program to raise awareness of space flight, stimulate children's interest in science and technology and engineering. And Greg Jarvis was flying as a, an employee of Hughes Space Division. He was an electrical engineer who worked on satellite design, and he was going to be doing experiments related to liquid propulsion systems. So he was flying as a scientist. Krista was flying uh, as a teacher. She was going to do a couple of classrooms from space and record others. Those would have been broadcast um, to directly into classrooms during the missions. Now, the two of them represented a hope that had been latent in the shuttle program all along, which was that the shuttle was safe enough that people who were not professional astronauts would be able to fly, and that increasingly more and more ordinary people would get to fly on the space shuttle. And um, I don't know that we can call any person ordinary, but if you're looking at the standards for being an astronaut and not being an astronaut, uh, Krista McAuliffe and Greg Jarvis represented uh, the citizenry. They represented us. Uh, if, if we had a reason and the ability to qualify, we might have been able to go into space as well. Now, this mission had drawn a tremendous amount of media interest because of Krista McAuliffe and the teacher in space, and it had drawn a huge amount of interest in the education community as well. Uh, obviously, everybody can identify with a teacher. Um, we've all had many of them in our lives, and we know how important they are in our lives. And so the education community, not just in the United States, uh, but even abroad, were paying close attention to this mission, and so too were the media. And uh, because of that, uh, students and teachers had gathered together in classrooms and auditoriums to watch the mission, and that was part of the horror of what happened, is that it happened in front of all these young people who had been brought together um, with the message, uh, this was to have been a teachable moment, they had been brought together with the message, let's watch this, this is something that might be possible for you to do in the future as well. And uh, then when the events turned tragic, that teachable moment became something much different. And teachers found themselves and parents found themselves talking to children about grief and death and loss and risk and um, trying to put into context how terrible things like this can happen to good people or how accidents happen in exploration. Um, so that was all part of the context uh, of that particular day. Um, another very momentous thing that happened that day was that President Reagan decided to forgo doing his State of the Union address and he gave a very poignant address to the nation that evening, uh, doing much the same thing that teachers and parents were trying to do, which is come to grips with sudden death and um, grief. And he was 
the mourner-in-chief, consoling the families, consoling NASA, and consoling all of us who had witnessed it or who were um, aggrieved by it. He used some beautiful rhetorical touches to help make the case that um, this was truly a national loss as well as a personal launch loss. He, um, he set the crew up as heroes and as pioneers. He embedded this tragedy in the history of exploration and in the American traditions of the frontier um, and of exploration in the U.S. And he, he basically situated them in this tradition of risking danger and sometimes giving one's life in the course of uh, pushing the frontiers and stepping out into the future. And he especially took pains to address children and, and to try to help them understand that when things like this happen, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the end. And he quite eloquently spoke of things will not end today. Um, as sorrowful as this is, the Challenger crew were pulling us into the future and we will continue to follow them. Um, and of course, he also uh, recognized them um, as um, heroic citizens of our country and indicated that their memories would live forever. We will not forget them. He said, we will remember them as we saw them this morning, uh, smiling and waving goodbye. And it was a very uplifting speech. I think actually one of his uh, better short speeches uh, for serving the purpose of um, addressing this as a national tragedy and offering the vast audience some comfort and some hope for the future. Uh, so, what actually happened? Uh, there are a number of misconceptions about that, and I'll try to address one of them uh, the, today, uh, but there, um, there are probably a half dozen misunderstandings about the accident. The technical cause of the accident became clear very quickly through photographic evidence. And, of course, it all happened in a matter of seconds. It happened barely a minute into flight. But um, the determination was that one of the rubber seals between segments of the solid rocket boosters had failed. And you can see uh, from this model how this, the solid rocket boosters are in sections. And those are put together with big rubber bands uh, called O-rings, very thick, uh, large rubber bands. But on one of the lower segments, uh, just about where the O-ring attaches to, I mean, where the solid rocket booster attaches to the external tank, and later you can come around to the side and see better, there are struts there. One of those O-rings failed to seal properly when the solid rocket booster ignited. And a contributing factor to that was that it had been very cold, extraordinarily cold the night before with temperatures below freezing. And rubber, of course, gets rigid when it's cold and it didn't have the flexibility it needed. So that was a contributing factor. We know of only one of the O-rings that had that problem. So uh, apparently the cold alone was not the only factor. Uh, with further analysis, it was determined that the joint itself had a flawed design that allowed for a gap to open if the, the ring didn't seal properly. And once that gap was there, the exhaust gases from the propellant burning inside could escape through the gap. And as they escaped, they burned a wider gap and a wider gap and burned through the case of the solid rocket booster. And the picture showed, uh, in a matter of seconds, a flame protruding from that solid rocket booster just like a blowtorch. And it began to impinge on the external tank, which is covered with insulation, but it's not meant to take that kind of direct heat. 
At the same time, while the, uh, the main thrust of the solid rocket booster was coming out the bottom end, a smaller thrust was now coming out the side where this flame was burning, and so that solid rocket booster began to twist on its struts. And the combination of stresses from that happening and the flame burning into the tank caused the tank itself to collapse. The, the bottom fell out of the tank. And as it ruptured, all the liquid hydrogen there, is it hydrogen on the bottom or oxygen? All the liquid hydrogen dropped out. And as the tank ruptured from the bottom, then it ruptured from the top also, and all the liquid oxygen came out, and they caused an immediate ignition, uh, the big flash, the big fireball that you see in the pictures. Now, one misconception is that an explosion caused um, the breakup of the vehicle, and the fact is it was breaking up already, and the explosion was a result of the breakup. That solid rocket booster twisted on around, it broke loose. The orbiter itself was trying, uh, its automated systems were trying to hold course. It was adjusting the thrust of the main engines. Uh, the solid rocket on the other side was also straining because it wasn't counterbalanced anymore by this one. So the whole vehicle was coming apart before we even saw the fireball. Um, at the time that the external tank and the solid rocket boosters came apart, so too did the orbiter come apart. It's attached uh, to the external tank. And as it broke free, it was subject to aerodynamic forces far beyond anything it could handle, and it began to break apart. And the tail and the aft section where the engines are broke free, with the engines still burning, one wing snapped off, another wing snapped off. The crew cabin and the forward fuselage pulled away from the payload bay, and the crew cabin and forward fuselage continued on an arc and then came down and dropped into the ocean intact and was not um, directly damaged until impact with the ocean uh, at something more than... Um, 200 Gs, I think, they, they uh, calculated the probable force. Um, nothing happened in the breakup itself that would have put enough force on the crew to have killed them. Uh, but as the forward compartment came loose from the payload bay and all the lines were severed, there was no more oxygen coming into the um, crew cabin. They had their temporary emergency oxygen packs, but there was limited oxygen there. They were essentially in free fall, and they probably blacked out very quickly. Uh, the medical report afterwards indicated that they, they quite likely were unconscious before they even really started descending. And uh, no one knows how long they were alive. Uh, if they were alive at impact, they would not have survived impact into the ocean. Uh, they, their remains were recovered and uh, returned to their families and were buried. So that was the technical cause of the accident. Uh, but then there was a month-long investigation thereafterward to look into all the hidden causes, you might say, or all the other contributing causes. And the Rogers Committee report, which was a report by a presidentially appointed commission, on the Challenger accident, laid out a, a number of contributing causes, uh, the primary one of which was inadequate precautions for safety in a variety of ways, that the joint design needed to be redesigned to be uh, a better design to preclude this accident from ever happening again, that NASA needed an independent safety office that was really reviewing everything, um, that um, there should be more astronauts involved in management of the program because the attention to safety had not been rigorous enough. And uh, the backstory to that was there was concern about the O-rings for months and several missions previously, uh, 
there was a, an effort going on to understand why they sometimes weren't sealing properly, but NASA continued to launch missions, thinking that it was not a fatal problem. And basically, one of the recommendations from the committee was you have to treat everything as potentially a fatal problem. You need a much more rigorous safety organization there. Uh, from the point of view of the shuttle workforce, I think the uh, main lesson learned from that assessment uh, that management had made mistakes, that there had been communication mistakes, and that safety had been shortcut. I think the main lesson learned to the shuttle workforce w was that you have to be eternally vigilant about safety, and if you see something wrong, point it out, insist that it get attention. Um, listen to the vehicle. It's trying to tell you something. If there's something that isn't right, pay attention to what isn't right, and don't assume that just because you've flown this vehicle 24 times, it's really routine spaceflight yet. It's not yet routine. You're still learning how to operate the vehicle. And since um, the Challenger accident or the Challenger tragedy, safety reminder cards have been issued to the whole shuttle workforce that they carry in their pocket or they carry in their billfold. And it's just um, an overt reminder. If you see it, say it. If you see something wrong, deal with it. Make sure it's brought to attention uh, because... Uh, not all the right people within the organization realized the scope of the potential O-ring problem uh, before this tragedy had happened. And then for the public at large, I think the primary lesson from the Challenger tragedy was that uh, we really can't take human spaceflight for granted. Uh, the shuttle had flown 24 times without any major uh, show-stopping events, it had begun to seem routine. Um, people weren't paying much attention anymore. It uh, wasn't making the broadcast news every time it launched, uh, very much in the same way that people had begun to lose interest in following the Apollo missions closely. Um, as you build up this flight rate and mission follows mission and everything seems routine and ordinary, it's possible to get complacent and a little too comfortable. And I think the main lesson that, that most of the public took away from that is that uh, spaceflight is still risky. It isn't routine. Um, I think we forgot that again, though, because then when the Columbia accident happened, we had to be reminded again that spaceflight is always experimental. It's always high risk. The workforce does what it can to manage the risk and uh, keep it under control or reduce it, but it's always there. Um, we mourn the crew, of course, um, but a lot of people, particularly in the workforce, mourn the vehicle also. Uh, in particular, every vehicle has a crew that's assigned to it that sees it through all of its preparations. And sometimes people shift from orbiter to orbiter uh, in the course of their time on duty, but mostly they spend all their time with one orbiter. So for the Challenger processing crew in particular, uh, losing Challenger was itself a cause for mourning and for grief. And uh, many of them really took it personally in terms of wondering, was there something more I could have done? Was there something I missed? Um, what can I do better next time? But um, they went through mourning for the vehicle also. And I know the Columbia uh, crew and uh, basically anybody who had flown on either vehicle felt that same way. There's a kind of personal relationship that develops. Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.